Good morning, and welcome to Many Paths, Many Visions, brought to you by the Labyrinth Society and with your host, Christiana Brinton. This episode is entitled, How Do You Seed an Entire Continent and Its Island Partner with Labyrinths? My guest today is an Aussie native and resident from San Remo, Victoria, near Melbourne, who has been instrumental in birthing and supporting the now vibrant labyrinth scene in Australia and Tasmania. My guest is Lorraine Rhoda, who for over a decade has worked tirelessly to bring forth the Australian Labyrinth Network and the Quarterly Labyrinth Matters newsletter. She and her team have hosted many labyrinth luminaries from around the world, such as Tony Christie, Lars Howlett, and Robert Ferre, not to mention creating and successfully managing the first Australian Labyrinth Network inaugural, inaugural gathering in April of this year. Lorraine, welcome to Many Paths, Many Visions. Thank you for joining me today. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, yeah, we had, we had a little bit touch and go there for a while, but we, we, we've managed to come on. <laughs> um, so I've had many requests from Australian citizens to have you on my show. Um, they really admire you and, and are so grateful for what you've done in the, in the past decade and longer. So I, I hope all the Labyrinth community down under is at least listening. Well, it's early. Well, it's late <laughs> at night now. We'll, we'll see into the broadcast. <laughs> of course, all the MPMV video, um, episodes are archived on the TLS website, the, uh, the Labyrinth Society website under media, and can also be found on, on YouTube under TLS uh, slash videos. So, not sure where to begin. If people are interested, they can read your personal Labyrinth story in the first Labyrinth Matters newsletter, 2007-2011, um, that are archived on the Labyrinth Network Northwest website and the 2015 to 2016 on the um, Australian Labyrinth Network um, ALN Facebook group. So I'd rather have you give our listeners uh, a timeline of events leading up to today that will encapsulate all that has happened over the last 10 years because it's been a huge amount. Um, is that a tall, tall order or is that doable? Oh, I think it's it's doable, so let's give it a go. Okay. I, I, thought, I'd, I thought I'd start first about a, a delightful story of birthing of my granddaughter, birthing of my first labyrinth experience, and sowing the seed on how we set up a labyrinth network across Australia. My very first walk was in 2003 in... Uh, the AIDS clinic in Arlington. And to my surprise, I got it. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to get. And I thought the experience that I had was going to be unique just to me, but David Gallagher assured me that it happens all the time. I couldn't believe that everyone had an incredibly simple and powerful experience just by walking a labyrinth. And it came down to knowing how to observe my walk, to understand its metaphor, and by taking action, experience the transformation. So the story is, instead of nagging my daughter, who didn't want to have a webcam so as I could see my granddaughter grow up uh, an American citizen, the message of my walk was that, well, I had my needs known, so just let it be out there. Returning from my walk, putting my granddaughter into a cot and gently stroking her face, she went to sleep. And to my delight, my daughter said, hey, Mum, we need a webcam on the cot. <laughs> so a simple message, but I got it. And I, the seed planted, I was going to grow something in Victoria, in Australia, but I didn't know what. So I looked on the Worldwide Labyrinth Locator and there are only two in Australia and they were both in Victoria. So that was my introduction and it was a pretty powerful one. So how did we seed the entire continent with labyrinths? Well, it boiled down to a really simple formula. The Labyrinth Society had 
created a countrywide position for a regional representative. It was Nice Glover from um, New South Wales. And it was in 2005. And then by 2008, the Australian community was really ready and willing to embrace the opportunity. But it took Veriditas um, coming into the formula in 2008 with service delivery. So it was a team effort really right from the start. The first part was starting in 2005 to the period 2007 and we had to find our direction. So it was Nice who set up an email tree between Lab and Society members and it finally reached us in Victoria. At, and at that time, uh, Mayor and Max, Jeff and myself were planning to go to our gathering in uh, Lenox in Massachusetts. And again, it was the Lab and Society policy that enabled Jeff and I to have a scholarship. So out of, out of that um, gathering, we came back pretty well convinced that we had to do something in our community. Merrin worked in mental health. She was manager of a community-based mental health service. And Jeff was in an architectural firm that was building hospitals. And I was in um, the Mental Health Research Institute. So I understood some of the issues uh, of people with mental uh, mental needs as well. So we, the four of us, that's Nice and, and the Victorians, we went for a weekend retreat to work out what we were going to do with this um, really budding uh, need to get out there and help others um, learn what we did. So we decided what the best thing to do was to set up a newsletter because we were aware that Cedar Press in South Australia back in 2003, she was actually the first person that had called out for an Australian, a voluntary Australian organisation to work with the Labyrinth. And she also wanted to um, help people find one where to walk. So she set up a Labyrinth locator, absolutely wonderful. It all... Um, it was all by state and territory. So if you wanted to know where to walk, you just clicked on the map and down dropped a list. So it was fantastic. So we felt we needed to support that initiative. And uh, what followed that? Um, the other thing we realised that we needed to do was to support both the worldwide lab indicator because we wanted to be part of a global network as well as the Australian Lab Indicator. So over the years, we've tried to keep those two in sync. Um, at the moment, the world lab, uh, the Australian Lab Indicator is being upgraded so that, in fact, we can uh, establish um, Labyrinth trails. So that's going to be wonderful. So finding our directions, uh, the last little bit of that was just by chance, Jeff and I had responded to a, an ad in the newspaper to help um, build a labyrinth at the Augustine Centre in Hawthorne. And uh, we went there and I said to um, Paul Sanders, the director, I said, hey, we really need to get Lauren Artress down here. And he said, well, as a matter of fact, she's coming next year in March. So there we were. So our making connections, our next step, was really, once that course was set up, the newsletter was used to direct um, information straight to the Labyrinth community in Australia. Uh, Lauren was pretty impressed, I think, because it was really helped make that, those uh, lectures and workshops and training viable. And I was really delighted because by that time I was the Australian representative for the Lab and Society because Nice had gone off and went to England to live. And uh, Lauren asked me if I'd be her representative or Veritas representative of Australia. And I thought that was um, pretty wonderful because I really wondered what the mystery was about facilitating them because I'd, 
I'd found a pretty powerful experience myself. So I thought, righto, this is my opportunity to find out more about it. I must say that I was very hesitant to do the facilitator training. Uh, at that time, I was pretty low myself in mood and uh, I thought, well, I'll do the lecture and I'll do the workshop. Uh, but um, Paul Sanders at the Augustine Centre thought he'd stretch me a little bit and offered to um, part fund my training, which was a pretty huge uh, gift uh, that he gave me. So I thought now I'd sort of describe, because now we've found our, um, found our directions, we've made very strong connection. So I thought I'd describe to you how the labyrinth helped me find what was needed. Uh, that was a labyrinth network. So if I could put it to you that, um, well, given my mood was pretty low and uh, confidence was pretty low, going to a facilitator training was something pretty special. And I got an awful lot out of the lecture, which was on Hildegard, and that was to get in touch with creativity. Mm -hmm. And then there was the workshop on um, Grail Castle, and Parsifal and, you know, the need to really ask yourself the right question. So at the end of the workshop, Lauren, <laughs> Lauren said to us now, if you dream tonight, remember it and bring it back to us tomorrow. So that was all right. First thing the next morning she asked the question and uh, Elizabeth um, uh, Persephone, she was talking about her dream, which was dressing up as Sophia. Mm. And mine was the opposite. I was dressing down. And Lauren said, I'd take that to the labyrinth if I were you. <laughs> so anyway, it came a time and walk in the labyrinth and I found myself gravitating to the sunlight streaming in the window. And then... As people were coming towards me, I found after about the fourth or fifth time of always stepping aside, it sort of hit me a little bit, gee, Lorraine, you're a bit compliant, aren't you? But the problem was I didn't know whether I stepped left, right, front or back. And to find my direction, which path I was on, I had to see where the other person was going. And, you know... <laughs> I don't know how many times, but I ended back in the centre. So mulling over this later on, I, I thought, well, you know, I don't really need to follow other people because I really know the direction. I could stand in the sunlight and lead. And so what I did was quite simple. I rang people. No, I didn't. I emailed them and said, hey, how about it? And everyone said, oh, but I don't know enough. And, of course, I said I didn't either, so let's do it together. So that's how we actually set up the Australian Labyrinth Network. Every state and the Australian Capital Territory um, were representative then. Uh, we still don't have one for the Northern Territory. We have four labyrinths there now, and we're hopeful that there's something happening this year. So okay, the last step, well, Lorraine, can I, just can I just interrupt for one second? This yeah. is wonderful, wonderful information. Um, you talk about this, the team effort, um, uh, who and Jeff, and so who else has been in instrumental in birthing all of these visions with you over the years? I mean, it sounds well, like it's been, you've had people in all the different territories and, and, uh, States and well, I think the layers, the people, and the layers that brought that into um, fruition started back in 2003 with Cedar Priest. Mm -hmm. um, not only did she set up the labyrinth locator and, and a call for people to join her, she um, created personal labyrinths um, 
canvas ones, public ones, you know, the finger lavins. And she also saw the need for the lavins to be involved in pain management and she involved uh, setting up lavins in schools. I've spoken about the next layer of leadership, which was Mayor and Jeff and I. And then the next one was, you know, setting up the regional representatives. And, you know, we had nine founding members in six states. Our current um, regional representatives or state coordinators, are there's 18, mm. and they're in the six states and the Northern Territory. And then in, prior to that, our past regional representatives were also from four states, and there's a huge list. Um, I can start naming them like Joe Cook, Siobhan Christensen, Julie Wilson, Cedar Prest, Beth Roberton from Western Australia, um, Lisa Shortridge, a magnificent labyrinth um, creator in Victoria, Christina Roundtree, Leonie Bryan, Dr Margaret Rainbird from New South Wales, mm -hmm. Heather Middleton and uh, Maya is also from there. In Queensland, we've got Ramona Lane, South Australia, we still have Cedar Prest and Jeff Traher who has been running monthly labyrinth events for 20 years. Uh, Carol Schroeder and Peter Bean. Uh, Western Australia, we still have Beth Robertson and Ned Crosley. ACT, we have Alison Meritini. So it's quite a list. Mm. Um, the past members are Carol Willis, Trudy Sabali, Paula McLeod, Helen Malcolm, Helen Brambley Jackson, Junita Valick, Emily Simpson, and Rick Sweat. And now but, you, you uh, have to include. That's, that's all until. Um, until now as far as the network, but there's been so much more new leadership. Um, there's Tina Christensen who, from the period of 2014, um, she did her first training in Brisbane and she actually did a change the name from what well, up until then we were operating as the Laban Society Australian Region um, she changed the name to the Australian Labyrinth Network, which was to um, reflect our origins as Australians and also our partnership with um, the Labyrinth Society also included Veritas. So it was a very timely change of, um, of name. And at the same time, she changed the format of the newsletter. It had a focus to... Um, the human experience of labyrinth walking and each uh, each quarter that was um, to a single topic. So it could have international writers in it as well as local. And, of course, then she got into the new technology that I wasn't um, familiar with and made it so much easier to send out newsletters through MailChimp. And um, I can tell you she dragged me screaming to Facebook. But, uh, <laughs> But she knows now, of course, that I'm well and truly hooked. I mean, so does everybody, I think. Mm -hmm. So that was that layer. Then we had um, 2016, we had Mark Healy from Tasmania. And uh, Mark had been for 20 years or so attempt, uh, making labyrinths and taking them to community festivals and men's festivals. And he felt it was about time we incorporated so he took his vision um, to the Sydney group with Emily Simpson uh, he felt we needed to have our website and a database of resources we need to do festivals that he found that were most beneficial um, particularly we needed a gathering and uh, the other passion of his was Lavin's trails and I'm sure there were many more so what he did was he consulted the Sydney group um, and also the informal lab network, which we call ourselves now. And then he did some resourcing. He visited the states and attended a board meeting, um, attended the gathering. And before he went, um, quite, quite um, deliberately, he said, when I get back, Lorraine, we're going to have a gathering so all things came out and made sure that that gathering happened as Mark had, um, had a passion to see us 
put together with him. Well, we, we really... So the next player was Emily, New South Wales. She convened a meeting of her Sydney group and she explored the vision with Mark. She saw the collection of funds that have helped contribute to our incorporation cost. And during a period of um, the next year, she helped refine the mission and purposes. So then there's lots of others. I mean, the work I did was coordinating the consultation across the um, network, help reach a consensus on the future directions of the legal entity. Uh, we drafted a proposal to be a company limited by guarantee as a not-for-profit, and we obtained quotes for uh, and thank, quotes for insurances, proposed membership fee, and uh, identified a professional booking service. So the last layer now, we're getting to 2006, from the Sydney group came Joy Bowles. Now, I must tell you that Mark, when he came to me about this network, he said, Lorraine, there are lots of skills up there we need. And I was convinced um, we needed people to help us. And Joy was one of the ones that stood right out, um, came forward. Firstly, she did propose the Labyrinth as a charity and I worked with her on that. Um, it was specifically focused to the mental field. But um, the network as a whole felt that that was a bit narrow and probably stage two. We needed to get stage one done. And she contributed to the research of options for the legal entity. Uh, she serviced all the meetings and uh, serviced the planning group meetings for the gathering. She coordinated and she trained us on teleconferencing for the gathering planning group. And this has had long lasting results because um, state um, regional coordinators uh, are not only using it now, but it's going to be a benefit to them in the future as they uh, strengthen their network within their state and territory. And then lastly, what she did was she was the host to welcome people to the gathering. So as you can see, you know, there are so many people yeah. that have been out there. So Lorraine, let's, uh, I want to go back to what Mark and I mean, he was wonderful to have with us at the gathering last year in, in Houston. And we so enjoyed him attending, uh, you know, he just, he just had so many questions and he was so interested and he was so uh, enthusiastic um really really good emissary for for your uh your burgeoning labyrinth uh scene down there so um the inaugural gathering that was sort of birthed out of that that's what you said he he said we got to have one of these um share some highlights uh if you can about what happened with this year oh it was an amazing team effort again um the, the program for the gathering was very creatively managed by Tina Christensen, who, who worked, worked seamlessly with, you know, a highly skilled group of people to ensure that the, the processes were inclusive of representatives of all states and territories, whether they were at the gathering or not. So the... The opening was the candlelight walk session by Tina and Kim Adele with the storytelling. Um, everyone sat around uh, saying how they came to the labyrinth. And symbolically, we had a ball of wool and um, that created our web. And actually throughout the gathering, that web was used. Uh, we had a candlelight walk and um, we walked that uh, with... Ariadne Street, as we called it, for our hopes and dreams for the network. So it was a beautiful start. Um, on the second day, we had a magnificent, um, well, first of all, we did a presentation, uh, Mark, Joy and I, about our legal entity and our draft um, mission and purposes. And that was taken to the next session uh, by Christina Roundtree. Christina, using open space technology, um, gathered people around, asked them to, or the regional representatives, forms 
um, locations within the um, the room on and, and they had up on paper what they were about and so people joined that and uh, so the mission um, was refined uh, the outcome was that we had to um, have more gatherings so that you know both rural and regional and city people could be involved uh, we they talked about how we could have financial stability, the importance of educating the public, how to keep communications going, uh, the need to set priorities, uh, membership model. Now, one of those issues um, is currently being taken up. The problem often is when freelance um, facilitators go out into the public to do community walks, they get into some difficulties with public liability insurance. So we're trying to set up an insurance um, policy whereby freelance um, people can um, get their uh, activities covered. And the further education and the mentoring of facilitators was seen, seemed to be very important, as was sharing the resources of the um, database. Uh, so the next next part of that is, you know, with Joy's work on that we, we use the program Zoom, uh, there were some people from the ACT that couldn't come. And so what they did is they there was a new labyrinth just opened there in Canberra. And so there was a connection from the gathering right on to the labyrinth where people were walking it. So that was seen as a real highlight of where we were to head in the future. I don't know Zoom. What is Zoom? Zoom is a bit like um, Go Meeting. Oh, okay. Yep. So the the benefit is that um, you can have up to twenty five people, and whoever's speaking, they're you know filling the whole screen. So you feel as if you know you know people. In fact, at the gathering, the um, Jill Brum from Tasmania, I gave her a big hug and you know, to, to say, nice to meet you. I'd already felt I did simply because of the work we'd done through Zoom. So it really helped the, um, you know, to be able to speak with someone and see them is fantastic. Yeah. So are there plans for a, a, a gathering every year? Are there plans for? A gathering every year down there. Ah, yes, uh, the working group um, out of the gathering. And might I tell you one of the amazing things of the gathering, I think, in fact, it was the highlight. We had a lot of process during the gathering and um, our Western Australian member, Beth Roberton, the first, on the second day, she said, hey, I don't want to leave here until we've got the president's name <laughs> yeah. of the network. So um, <laughs> the group were basically sent back to rethink what the next part of the program was. And out of that, all standing around the labyrinth, without a word, people stepped in to where they wanted to be in the planning group, which mm. um, was set up the, the constitution insurance, uh, the labyrinth locator and networking, defining needs of the membership, which I mentioned before, uh, the spiritual practice of the network and planning the gathering. So. We've got Beth Roberton already set up the New South Wales gathering next April and their next task, they've got a gathering planning group and the next task is a gathering in Western Australia in 2009. So they're well underway. That's fabulous. So you mentioned one of the things that, that people sometimes have problems with is insurance or something so and i so i know i'm sure there's other pitfalls or stumbling blocks that people face or that you faced i mean it hasn't it's that you know from what you talk talk the way you talk it's like it's smooth but i know we both know that that isn't the way it happens necessarily so what have been some of the stumbling blocks are or, or that you've had to face and 
and and have you had resolutions or sometimes not well i it supports it it's only when you've got freelance facilitators um going out into community that the problems and Certainly we did have that. Uh, we were invited by the Parliament of World Religions to put on a community event. Uh, that was absolutely horrific. I mean, we were delighted, of course, but we had to get permission from the Melbourne City Council. The Melbourne City Council required us to be a legal entity to have in public re uh, oh, liability right. insurance. So we ended up having to get um, a women's spirituality group to become our host. But of course, their public liability insurance meant um, they couldn't extend it to what we were planning to do. So um, to put on the event, which is a five day um, or five walks, one of which was a candlelight walk, we had to um, purchase the insurance and it was $500, which was Australian, which is a lot of money. And... Um, but they said, look, you can have it for six months. So we said, right, we'll make it. Oh, and it was going to be another 100. So we did that. And we ended up having um, a walk with the Healthy Parks, Healthy People in Orgel Conference in Melbourne. And we managed to put in a World Labyrinth Day public walk as well. So it was probably good value for money. But it was, um, you know, the, the scramble around to, to get insurance to find a host. Uh, was problematic. But before we move on a little bit, I just feel I need to um, go back to the gathering because one of the key um, events at that gathering was honouring those that had walked the labyrinth before us and that's, you know, going back at a 23-year period. Uh, the session was organised by Chris, uh, Tina Christensen. So what happened was we had the names of 24 people who did the first of anything in Australia, labyrinth-wise. And so um, everyone read something out about the person. And then to honour their um, shining the light on the path for us, we had a lantern walk around the labyrinth. And whilst we were walking around the labyrinth, we were singing that person's name. So there was such a beautiful chorus of, of, um, of joy and song. Um, and we had a, a harp as a um, to support the the um, music, and then when everyone finished walking into the labyrinth, the lanterns were left in the centre, which was you know holding the space and honouring our elders, um, and in a way walk, welcoming them into the um, the wisdom circle of the Australian Labyrinth Network. So then once that had finished, um, the 24 people that had sung in the person's name, then their ceremony was walking out of the labyrinth, acknowledging and celebrating their own labyrinth journey. It was a very special ceremony. That sounds amazing. Do you have that on that video? Was. Is it recorded on video? Um, no. <laughs> oh, dear. No, but there'll be more times and uh, I, it really came from a very special ceremony that uh, Lauren Artris introduced to our first uh, facilitated training and, uh, yeah, it was a very powerful experience uh, for me to, um, to do that at that time. Speaking of Lauren... Um you, you, you've hosted a lot of Veritas trainings in Australia. So how has this affected the proliferation of proliferation of labyrinths <laughs> down under? You know, I know that, that, you know, you talked a lot about going through the training yourself. And so now that many more people have gone through the training, how has this, how has this helped or supported uh, the spread of labyrinths? There, down there. Well, uh, yes, we've had, um, it's just been incredible. We've had Lauren out here biannually since 2008 um, mm. and it's had an amazing impact 
on the labyrinth here. As I said, in 2003, there were two, and now we have 137. <laughs> mm. And, uh, you know, the time's really right um, for Mark to come up with his labyrinth trails. In fact, Jeff and I did a, a, a trail run, if you like, from Melbourne to Canberra and around um, eight of their 14, um, although there's only seven on the labyrinth locator. Alison Mer Meritini up there, she found another 10 before we got there. Huh. Um, <laughs> so in Australia, in Victoria now, we've got 52 labyrinths, so we're really right to set up some labyrinth trails. And I think Lisa Shortridge up in the Shepparton area, she's already on the way for doing that. So, so what we've got, Lorraine, Lorraine, explain what you mean by labyrinth trails, please. Labyrinth trail? Yeah. Um, well, what we did in Canberra was we um, we worked out an area that uh, had a, a cluster of labyrinths that we could do in a day or two days. And then we, um, Alison Maritini had arranged for us to meet people there and people told us about their, you know, their, their labyrinth, their story. And we got a chance to walk all of them, which was pretty special. Oh, okay. There's so, one, so one you place connect... in Canberra. One place in Canberra is pretty special. It's called the Gathering Place, and it was um, it's been uh, created by the I think it's called the Bridgerdine Nuns or Sisters, and uh, I couldn't believe it. There, you know, beautiful labyrinths, and it took us into the hall and. Along the hallway, there's all these Australian photos of Australian poets, and in the chapel, there was a labyrinth, um, not labyrinth, uh, Aboriginal paintings and and stone tools, and you know, really special. And uh, what what they're doing there is um, is bringing the arts into um, to their uh, scriptures and making it very special. Um, if anyone gets a chance to go to the gathering place in Canberra, it'd be well worth your, their effort. So, so, so that's what uh, we, do. You know, we just arrange it, arrange a, an area to go. So, what's happening with Cedar's map? We can now see the GPS uh, points on the map, and uh, we're going to set up a little um, uh, photos of of it. Uh, areas that you could perhaps do in a day and have them linked somehow on to either CEDAR's website or when we get our own website uh, for the Australian Labyrinth Network, it could probably go there. But with this, at this stage, we're just working on getting the clusters together. Um, and then uh, Jeff um, Rodder is working with Jeff Selwood and so they're keeping those um, labyrinth locators uh, in sync and um, yeah, hopefully, you know, shortly we'll have Cedar's um, updating done, and we'll find um, how to get it out there. So what you're saying is that you create day day trips that include X amount of labyrinths, and and overnight trips or two day trips as well, or is it yes. strictly day yeah. trip? Well, it can do what we did is we did a trip up to Canberra, did the Canberra Labyrinths. This is on the Hume Highway, and then back via the coast. And you know, we met people along the way there too. I think we did four labyrinth walks on the way back. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, you'd have several um, nights away. Okay. Be as yeah. long as people want, really. Mm -hmm. Sounds wonderful. And so you're going to then take these groupings that you've created and add it to your uh, uh, Australian Labyrinth Locator? Well, that's what we're hoping to do. We um, haven't worked with Cedar on the detail on that, um, but that's the idea. Okay. So has anybody taken the advanced Fruititas training down there? In Australia. Oh, of course, um, Helen Malcolm, uh, both Emily Simpson was on the board from about 2013 for her term. And then after that, Helen Malcolm, Dr. Reverend Helen Malcolm from 
the Rural Medical School in Shepparton, which is part of Melbourne University. She, um, she's done her advanced training. I'm not sure. I think Emily has. Um, we, uh, we've had a few visits of Lawrence when we've had advanced days, but I'm not sure how many have actually gone uh, and become, you know, completed the, their training. Of course, with Helen, what she has is um, she now has an online course through Veritas, which is about transitions. So uh, I'm really looking, and a few of us are planning to take that and then perhaps get together and and talk through with um, between ourselves about about that course because I think that's the way to go for us. It's so expensive to travel overseas. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, of course, Emily um, Emily Simpson's work with the Centennial Park Labyrinth was uh, not only a huge benefit to um, people in Sydney because it's a state-of-the-art sandstone labyrinth. She raised uh, half a million dollars over a couple of years, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, not only that, it was the energy going in to make sure there were labyrinth walks back out on the site. She um, kept the chalk labyrinth going uh, the whole time and she ran walks. Uh, Jeff and I attended a walk that she had in a, a former church building and um, walks and talks everywhere. And the overall benefit uh, Australia-wide is that it got a lot of coverage and I had I had people stopping me in the street. Um, oh, so that's what a labyrinth is, <laughs> you know. Mm. It was just tremendous um, to do that. So we've had a few high-profile labyrinths. I mean, of the 137 labyrinths, um, actually when I look at it, it's 2012 was an incredible period because we had the Healesville Community Labyrinth. Now that was the work that Merrin did up there straight after the gathering. Um, Jeff, Merrin and I had built a sand one first, but in 2012 um, they had a, a permanent labyrinth funded partly by state government, local government, arts and community. And then we had the Children's Hospital in Westmead in Sydney with their labyrinth. Now, Dr Michael Stevens there always talks about it as the clock of the long now. Um, then we have the one that um, Helen Malcolm's in, that's also 2012. And then we had the Heidelberg Repatriation Hospital, which is um, a war veterans hospital. And uh, the war, war widows there, they funded that. I think it was $250,000, which was absolutely fantastic effort. So you can imagine with a higher profile in Labyrinths, the sort of the acceptability of, you know, people taking labyrinth walking seriously has been a significant factor. And I and I think too, um, if you think about, you know, if Mayor and Jeff and I had come back from uh, the labyrinth gathering and set up our own little newsletter, it, it wouldn't have had half the benefit as being sponsored in the way that um, the Labyrinth Society did. As I said to... Um, David Gallagher, I said, oh, David, you know, how am I going to promote this? And he said, well, you know, particularly for events. And he said, oh, well, make it the Latin Society Australian region. And, of course, I think that was, as you could imagine, that was a fairly important thing. And then, of course, with Ruditas, um, the, then, of course, we had, you know, which is, when I first met David, I said, why aren't you doing labyrinth facilitator training, David? And so I understood the reasons for the separation, but he said that if ever it was going to happen under one umbrella, it'll happen down there under. <laughs> yeah. And Lauren, uh, Lauren was very supportive of that idea um, and said to me, look, you know, keep it all together. That's yeah. the way to go. Yeah. yeah. So bringing the community development with the service delivery, and I think that's what's made it work. Well, this has been such an amazing conversation, Lorraine. Uh, so much information. I've seen many pictures of the Centennial Labyrinth, and it is stunningly beautiful. 
Uh, I, I someday hope to get down there uh, and visit you all and, and walk again. I, I was there many, many years ago um, and would love to go back. But so what, tell us a little bit what's going to, ha- what the future is. What are some future events besides the, ga- and the gathering? You have talked a little bit about that. Um, do you have any construction plans yourself for labyrinths or, or are you involved with uh, workshops or uh, who's coming to visit to give workshops uh, uh, in the future? Yes, we've, um, <coughs> there's, there's two special labyrinths that are just happening. Um, one is up near Port Stephens, Newcastle area in New South Wales. And it's a joint venture between um, a suicide prevention group with the Boats and Harbour and Parks group. So you can imagine this is on a a very um, exposed headland and uh, the, 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 um, what shall we say, The, the name of the labyrinth or the purpose of the labyrinth is being a contribution, um, enduring contribution to the spiritual element. So you can take that physically as well as um, mentally, emotionally. So that's a very special project up up there. And another one is in um, Tumut. Now that's a special project as well because um, the paving on the labyrinth there is of a 25 million old stone. Mm. And um, part of the labyrinth there, they've actually got the, um, reflecting the positions of the planets as they were over that area on Armistice Day in 1918. So for that community, um, that's going to be a very special project. and. Um, They've also got, uh, for those planets, they've got um, they've a beautiful mosaic in stone. So I'm looking forward. That's at Tumut. And um, for those who know about the Snowy Mountain Scheme, that's in that area, that river, the Tumut River, is part of the Snowy Mountain Scheme, which is a hydroelectric power. And um, Christina Roundtree, um, and if you just informally at this stage, we want to work on a curriculum for labyrinths and schools. And this came about because uh, the state government took religious instruction out of schools. And so there's a wonderful opportunity. Um, we're hoping to work with the multi faith community who have um, really spelt out what they're looking for in the schools. And to my mind, it spells labyrinth. So um, we thought we'd have a look at that. Most, most impressed with Lorraine Villamere's 12-week program for transformation. And uh, we'd also like to see um, the labyrinth across the school's curriculum. So there's that little working group happening. And then in September, Emily's got her first inaugural, first inaugural, her inaugural dreaming festival, which will be a variety of labyrinths in Centennial Park, and I think she might even throw a maze in for the fun. And then Judith's trip, she's down here at um, Perth at Nathaniel's Rest on the third to the tenth of September at Amberley in Melbourne, fifteenth uh, to the seventeenth, and then at Sydney. Um, Kincumber South between the 22nd and the 24th. And then we've got um, next year, 2018, 20 to 22nd of April, the Australian Labyrinths Gathering Network in um, in Sydney. Keynote speaker, uh, Lisa Moriarty, mm. Circles of Inspiration her topic. Uh, I bought my first labyrinth, finger labyrinth of Lisa, so I'm looking forward to to actually meeting her and uh, we're hoping we will have a pre-gathering workshop for canvas uh, labyrinth making and help um, use that as a fundraiser to cover the speaker's cost etc so that's that's about 
all I know of, I'm sure there's much more because what the, the Labyrinth Network really operates um, without any, at this stage, without any core um, organisation and all of the work over the years has been done really through the regional reps working with their communities. So there's probably a great deal more out there, but um, they're the ones I'd like to highlight at the moment. So, uh, great. That sounds amazing. So glad Lisa's going to get down there. She is an amazing uh, labyrinth person and, you know, consummate uh, speaker and workshop presenter. I mean, she's uh, brilliant. So the, you'll, you'll really enjoy her. Um, yes. Um, but Judith Tripp, she's going to be doing her overnight dream quest on the Labyrinth work. Is yes. that what she's going to be doing? Yes, doing that um, in um, Perth, uh, Western Australia, Victoria and New South Wales. So she's certainly uh, getting around. We're hoping to catch up with her. I won't get to the um, dream quest at Lower Plenty, but um, we're hoping to catch up in some way. Well, it, it is something not to be missed. I mean, uh, if you can figure out how to work your schedule and, and manage one, it's really a very, oh, very special. Last, yeah, we did have last year, Judith, or the year before, Judith was, we had her here in Melbourne. She was in, uh, okay. she had a wonderful um, workshop in the in the desert and of Western Australia. So she's had, um, yeah, Obviously, she's needed because she's back again so quickly. <laughs> That's great. So uh, this has been a wonderful episode, Lorraine. Thank you so much. Um, we are we have pretty much gone through the hour. Uh, we're pretty much <laughs> pretty much out of time. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure. Oh yes, it, me. Too. It's been such a pleasure sharing this hour with you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Many, many continued blessings on your path, and you're, uh, we're, we are we on on the Labyrinth board, the Labyrinth Society board, and and the Labyrinth Society community are so supportive of you all, and and so appreciative of what you're doing, and down there, it's just um, it, the energy is we feel it, <laughs> we feel the energy <laughs> from from there. So, um, just to speak, well, I must you. say that. Over the years, uh, right from the outset, the support from the Lavin Society um, to myself personally, from Lauren to myself personally, uh, but, uh, you know, there are many members of both organisations that as individuals have um, provided support and encouragement uh, along the way. And so it's been wonderful for me to be able to acknowledge all of that and to acknowledge the team that's been here. As I say, we were ready and willing and able to um, to embrace the policy of the Lab and Society. Uh, what we need to do, of course, is to um, build up our membership. And uh, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the website has got so much to offer. And I know that um, Jan Lewis is really keen to work with us through, um, you know, go meetings and, uh, you know, really strengthen um, our understanding of what the resources are that Lab and Society have so that can be um, filtered down through our communities. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and many continued blessings on your path. Thank you. You too, Christiana. So you've been listening to the Labyrinth Society's Many Paths, Many Visions, broadcast by Spreaker with your host, Christiana Brinton. Be sure to check the, the TLS website, Facebook page, and Global Group, YouTube, and Google Plus for a list of upcoming dates and guests. Also, if this podcast has piqued your interest in the Labyrinth Society and you'd like more information about membership, please go to www.labyrinthsociety.org forward slash membership. Uh, namaste, ciao, and may you find what you need on your path through life. Good night.